Well, good morning. Always great to be in the house here at Victory. It's warm in here today. That's great, isn't it? I was going to wear my jacket, get dressed up like Louis, but... Uh, so we welcome to all those that are joining in with live streaming. Normally when we meet as an apostolic council and spouses, there's 12 of us. This time there's only 11 of us. There's Shelley is out in Australia, but she's watching the live stream right now. So Shelley, hello Shelley. Walk <laughs> chat out. Say hi Shelley. Hi. She's wonderful. Keith and Shelley became grandparents for the first time. They got old as well. Wonderful. Well, it's been wonderful just to um, have this time together, just sharing around our leadership time and uh, in this wonderful subject of Compelled by Love. We've had a blessed time of worship, fellowship, teaching, some excellent stand-up comedy, and uh, it's just been a great time to be out together. Church is receiving this live stream. We have a great diversity in our life in Church of the Nations, so some may be in meetings that finish in an hour, some that finish in an hour and a quarter, some that go an hour and a half, some that go two hours. So so I fit in with everybody today. I'm just going to do what some of the other leaders did and the speakers did during the conference, is that every 15 minutes I'm just going to say, now I'm approaching my last point. <laughs> so whenever you check out of the stream, you just know you just heard the last point. Well, I'm a decade older than I was when I came here last time, <laughs> as I turned 70 earlier in the year. That was a wonderful thing to turn 70. It's the best party I've ever had. It's just gone on and on. And uh, started with a surprise one in an Indian restaurant in London, but went on and on through the time. But it's funny, when you turn 70, how many in the room are 70 or above today? Four of us? Six? <laughs> eight of us? We are the next generation. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> uh, there's a few of us here. Well, you know, when you turn 70, you do evaluate a few things. And um, I don't know whether to compete with the speakers or the stand-up comics today, but I'll have a bit of both, I guess. But you do, um, you reflect a little bit. And, uh, you know, some scriptures that used to be encouraging are no longer encouraging. You find that about the Word of God with different stages of life. You know, there was a time if you're about 30 and you're looking on and you take a promise of God that you're going to live three score and ten, you get excited. But when you're 70, <laughs> three score and ten is not as exciting as it used to be. So then you get back to the beginning and get back to Genesis and then God says you're going to live to 120 and that one gets exciting again for a while. So we start pressing into that and believing for that. And then last week, the oldest lady in the world died at, in India at age 117. And we think, yes, we're getting there. Slowly, we're getting back there. It's exciting. <laughs> you see, when you begin to get a little older, you begin to realize that things are changing, as we've already heard, very quickly. And people try to encourage you. You know, someone will come up to you and say, we just want to tell you that being 70 is really now the new middle age. Now, if you're a positive person like me, that's quite encouraging. But if you're a negative person, that's a disaster, isn't it? You say, oh, no, now I've got to go through another midlife crisis. <laughs> I've still been getting out of the other one. A few weeks ago, a short few months ago, I was down in Nicaragua. And uh, I was down there with three leaders of apostolic networks and one prophet. That's a good balance when you travel, really. But um, it takes usually about three apostolic gifts to control one prophet. <laughs> and um, we were down there just to do some training, <laughs> to do some training of some young leaders. And... Uh, it's a wonderful story, really. There was a young man, I'll just tell you the story. I just want to, I'm just here to encourage you today and be dad in the house a bit. But um, there's a young man that uh, was in California, a young Nicaraguan man that was in California and running with gangs a few years ago and 
was really um, like it was death, a criminal before she got saved. And uh, I think that was a test of it. But, <laughs> but was down um, uh, just running with gangs and eventually got arrested in California on two accounts of attempted murder and was incarcerated. And during the time of incarceration, there was a lot of trouble in his life and eventually one of the cases was put back as self-defense and different things. And after serving some time, still as a young man, got released, instantly handed over to immigration and deported back to Nicaragua. And in that process, he got radically born again. And during that time, he um, just incredible things happened in this young man's life. Well, he's been back in uh, Nicaragua now and and in the last um, 10 years, has planted 10 churches down there. So some of us went down from Canada and uh, the States, just to help train his leaders and to uh, help them just be raised up in kingdom issues and father. This young man has incredible vision for the kingdom without ever hearing a message on it. He got saved and God just baptized him really into the gospel of the kingdom. And he has a, just a great heart to see his nation transformed. But... Um, you know, we were down there and traveling with our prophet guy, who's a friend, many of the people here know him, but his name's Barry, and um, Barry comes from Canada and he's an Indian. He comes off a, a reservation, really, or on the edge of it. I don't know how, what percentage of an Indian, but he likes to claim it. And so he wears a mohawk haircut. So it was funny when we were down there, all the people wanted to come and take a photo of him and me together. And we wondered why, and then we realized that together we have one full hairdo. <laughs> but Barry's a tremendous prophetic guy, and we had great, great fun. You know, it's amazing today, I've got a son-in-law and others, you know, they shave their head totally. Not everyone does it, but some do. Shave their head totally, and I often think, you know, it's, in, it's an interesting thing, isn't it? Like you're going bald and um, then you shave your head because you don't want people to know you're going bald, so you make yourself totally bald. <laughs> I guess there's logic in there somewhere. But, you know, there's a downside to that as well, do you realize? There's a downside to having a shaved head because in cold weather you can never, ever really, you can never really wear a, a polar neck sweater because you're going to walk around looking like an underarm deodorant stick. <laughs> now, coming to my last point. We've been reminded by Willie that the world's changing very fast. And when you've lived a few years, like some of us, you realize just how fast it really is changing. And we can have some fun with it and joke around a bit, but it really is changing so fast. If you were over 70 here today, then you were born at least back in the 40s. And since I was born and then grew up in the 50s and 60s, life has changed a lot. Eating has changed a lot. Food, everything has changed. It's really quite incredible, isn't it? I can remember back in Australia when curry was just a surname. <laughs> no one ever ate a curry, really, way back. In Australia, no one ever ate pasta. A takeaway was a mathematical problem. <laughs> Pizza was something to do with a leaning tower somewhere. And a Big Mac was something that English people wore when it rained heavy. Eating raw fish was called poverty, not sushi. <laughs> and none of us had ever heard of yogurt. It's amazing, really. Healthy food consisted of anything that was edible. <laughs> and people who didn't peel potatoes were lazy. Cooking outside was called camping. And prunes were medicinal. <laughs> Drinking water came out of a tap. And if someone had have told us back then that the day was coming when we would pull into a petrol or gas station and pay more for water than we did for the gas or petrol, we would have laughed at them. 
But things change. I was at a concert for um, my oldest grandson who's graduating high school this year, and he plays in orchestras and, and different bands and things, and was at a school concert. And I can remember back if we went to anything, all that the announcement would be would be, would we mind not speaking while the performer, talking while the performance is going on? These kids had their performance and this was what was on their sheet. Please remember to silence all devices and to refrain from using such devices during the performance. This includes telephone conversations, texting, web browsing, status updating, selfie sticking, Instagramming, tweeting, Snapchatting, Pokemon going, etc. Your student performers and fellow audience members appreciate your temporary sacrifice. <laughs> the world has changed, but a bit more serious. I live in a city of, which is the race capital of America, really, and the place where the nation was really founded in so many ways. Main university in the town put out a questionnaire uh, that was to do with safety and the students had to fill out the situation. It's amazing how much remember back where the questionnaire would have been male or female. This was the question, how would you best describe your gender identity? Feminine, masculine, trans woman, trans man, questioning, gender queer, intersex stroke DSD, no label, self-identity, androgynous, pansexual or other? <laughs> I read that and thought, I wonder if anyone put other. <laughs> and what the other was. Just a university questionnaire to find out who's on campus. Things have shifted since I started on this journey. Amen. We just had a funny belief back there. In the beginning, God created Man and woman, he created them. But what a day we have to see this love of the kingdom reach a confused and mixed up and dying world. It's an amazing day in which we live really, isn't it? See, the prophet Isaiah, and that's what it's good to get in our hearts today, that we are winning. When you read some things like that, you think, are we really? You know, one of the questions people often ask when you a kingdom teacher, is really, if we're winning, why are things getting so bad? That question comes more than any other question when you have questions and answers. But the answer is very simple, and we teach on it often, but is this, in the great prophecy in Isaiah about the kingdom of God and the king's coming and all of that kind of thing, it says, at the same time, darkness will rise and, dark, and deep darkness will cover the earth. The light always shines much better in darkness. But both are happening at the same time. The prophet Isaiah wrote about a kingdom that I preach on so often that would known only increase. A group called World Revival Network from Kansas City, they reported in their update recently in the spread of Christianity that in AD 100, 100 years after Christ in that sense, but AD 100, one out of every 360 people on the earth, on the world, were followers of Christ. By AD 1000, one out of every 220 were Christians. By 1500, one out of every 69 people who were alive at the time were believers in Jesus. By 1990, the number of followers had risen to one out of every seven. It is now estimated that there's 7.5 billion people on the earth and 2.3 billion of the people that inhabit the earth are followers of Jesus, one third. That's now one out of every three. See, this kingdom will know nothing but increase. If we don't know what is real, now I know that those statistics probably include all kinds of traditional Christians and people who just own the name, maybe not know Christ as we would understand and things, but it is still... Incredible when you think about it. You've got to see a big world view to keep encouraged when everything you see around you seems to be fighting the very thing that needs to encourage you. Because it's very easy to get locked. Where we, we live in a, a city like Richmond where I said I live a lot of time out of it, but you know our family lives there and our grandchildren and our church life and people around us. 
live there. If they just lived and saw what was going on in Richmond itself, they could live very discouraged. Although there's bright things going on as well. But if you see it from the big perspective, like Willie was sharing with us the other night, you realize this kingdom knows nothing but increase and from that day that Jesus declared from the cross, it is finished, Satan's rule of the earth is over, Adam is back and Father gave him his Eve, the kingdom has known nothing but increase. We've got a lot to rejoice in and a lot of rejoice about. This year in which we live is for us, there's two important events, one very important, but one important for us. But this is the 500-year anniversary of the Protestant Reformation. And I've, in my heart, aimed towards this year because the last number of years, many of those years, once a year, I try to get into the Eastern Bloc of Europe and just to be in a city called Magdeburg. Now, I have a friend there that leads a little work there and... Um, I'll be with him later on in October this year. But this city was the first city in the Protestant, in the, after the Protestant Reformation, after Luther um, did what he did and what happened, that basically totally turned to be Christian. The mayor of the town, there was such turmoil in the town, he called Luther to come to preach. And Martin Luther went there to preach, and as he preached, basically the whole of the town turned to Christ. It's a city of about 230, 250,000 people now. It's in the old eastern block of Germany. It sits right between Hanover and Berlin, if you know that part of the world at all. It used to be on, uh, in the eastern block and on the border, the fence road that would go into Berlin, which half of Berlin was in West Germany, of course. And if you was going to the west, you would go just past it. But now it's open, of course, and you go in there. In that city now, there's less than a thousand believers. And born again, spirit filled believers, probably no more than 200. A mega church there that he's a part of would be 40, 50 people. That would be a mega church. That area has been declared statistically by government officials that from there in that top part of Germany, is there are more people there than anywhere else in the whole of the world? that have no belief at all in any God, anything, spiritual life, just total humanistic area. It's, a, it's, a, it's known as the biggest population area in the world. It's right there in that part of Germany. People working in there for God and believing for God to break through, getting a person saved, I mean, is an incredible uh, effort. And I'll be back in there in October this year. I love the little church there and I love being with the people. And Torsten and Sibylla who lead the work there over the years, Mara and I have been very close to them. First met them back in 1980. And, uh, but you know they are on fire for God, but you know working in such tough situations. And yet just in the Protestant Reformation day, 500 years ago, every single person there turned to Christ. I stand in the streets there sometimes, I walk the streets, there's a big dome, church building there, massive, you know, traditional church that tourists come from all over to go to. And I stand there sometimes and say, God, you did it once, you could do it again. You could turn a city in a day. You could turn a nation in a day. If God answered all the prayers that went up yesterday, South Africa would be changed in a day. It doesn't take a long time, but it might. And to be able to minister into these situations with this incredible love of God that can break through and bring answers to situations. If you've ever been in that part of the world, it's incredible. Because the first time I went into Magdeburg, Mara and I went in, it was just after the walls came down. And we're in there, and you could not believe this, these areas were in Berlin at the same time and got into, uh, across the border in Western and Eastern Berlin. But the difference was incredible because 40 years under socialist communistic control, from the day that happened, 
Nothing happened. For 40 years, it was like not one piece of paint had ever been put on a building. There was never one upgrade in electricity or anything else. It was like the whole place stood still for 40 years. We'd go in the streets and laying on the streets to be Russian sh soldiers that were occupying there, selling their badges off their uniforms just to get cigarette money because the Russians did not have enough money to bring their own soldiers home once the wall came down. And they were living on the streets and squatting in what used to be the mansions of Germany. If you go into these areas, you realize the incredible need and yet the incredible destruction of that which is not the kingdom of heaven and the power of God that can get released through that. So that's a wonderful time we're living in. There was a young lady, I think, I can't remember exactly who it was, but a few years ago that got my attention about this, was walking in an area of Britain and just half tripped over a little monument that was half buried and it was a monument of the Reformation and um, I, she looked at it and just felt God told her this, world, this word and the word that she felt God said was this 500 years ago I gave the scriptures to the ordinary people this time in 500 years time like in, in 500 years from that I'm giving the church back to the ordinary people. And in Europe, it was a tremendous statement, of course. You know, we've heard of the changes, the shifts, that which is going to happen, and that the Spirit of God fell on all men, and all are empowered. But God's going to deal with control and manipulation. He's going to deal with hierarchical structures that lock people into prison rather than setting them free. God is setting his people free to again see nations shift and change. And we need to be believing, I believe, pray for Europe as well as praying here because I believe something very significant could happen in the next few months in Europe. Something, there could be a visitation of God around, you know, nations like Germany, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people will celebrate Pentecost, will celebrate um, the Reformation holidays that will celebrate this wonderful event and not have a clue of what it's really all about. But if God dropped in the midst, 500 years since we had the protest church was started. We call it the Protestant church. It was the protest church. 500 years on, I believe we're living in an incredible significant moment in history. Here for us in our Church of the Nations family, we're going to start in England in our leadership there uh, in a few months' time, celebrating what we see as our 40th anniversary in our Cotton family. Because it was there 40 years ago in England that Marilyn and I, after going through a tremendous um, eruptive, disruptive time in our life, that had really put us into a lot of doubt in our heart of who we were and what we were about. And from there, I won't go into the details today, but from there arrived in England. And we arrived in England, Marilyn and I, with two children in our arms and a couple of suitcases and a couple of other pieces of luggage being sent and a team of about 10 people and a $200 to our name. I remember getting off at Heathrow Airport thinking, God, what are we even doing? I was asking big questions in those, am I even saved? I mean, to put it in the context, in the work we'd been and had gone into deception, um, we'd been excommunicated to hell with a hundred other people. I knew the pain of having to walk down streets and seeing people that we had led to the Lord come the other way towards us and were told they had to cross the street and not speak to us and walk on the other side. And overnight, that movement went into deception. I remember the day the leader brought the message. He spoke on the Song of Solomon and the whole work went into deception. 99% of that message I believe today, but it only takes 1%. And now overnight, they became one of the biggest missionary outreach sending movements in Australia at that time, overnight, shut it all down, brought everyone back, brought everyone in and said, we never have to evangelize again. We never have to go out again. Because the Bible says in the Song of Solomon that we become the garden enclosed. And as we just become the church, the 
flavor of it goes up and over the walls and people come. But we never have to go and get them. We only have to be. And in a moment, I remember sitting in a leaders meeting and asking the leader, how did you get saved? And he, said, he looked, looked it straight and he said, I got saved through Billy Graham. And I said, now you're against evangelism. And he looked at me and said this straight out. He said, because God used second best methods once, he doesn't have to do it again. We didn't know whether we were totally deceived. In the end, we went to a council with some Anglican vicars that uh, had healing ministry and they walked us through it. They said, we'd seen this happening, going into deception, but we knew you had a different heart. We've been praying that God would deliver you and get you out. They ministered to us and, and got us out, but we arrived totally I could use the word disillusion, but one thing I've learned over the years is this. If you ever get disillusioned, you have to have an illusion in the first place. And that's to learn, not to have an illusion about what ministry is about, not to have an illusion about church, not to have an illusion about the kingdom. I have to know some stuff and get to know what it's about. Because many of us are just caught up with something we saw on TV or some message we heard or the latest fad or this or that and we get an illusion and all of a sudden we get disillusioned. But I tell you, it was a painful start. Miraculously, through some precious friends which we're going to honour and walk through uh, and honour in um, October time, September, that, our leadership time there, God began to teach us his father hard and wrapped some leaders around us that gave us some hope that laid their lives down for us. You understand, this situation we'd come out of in Australia, the leader of that had written, they were quite a famous ministry in many ways, and they had written a letter to every leader they knew across the world and said, if you ever have anything to do with Tony Fitzgerald, you can never have anything to do with us again. And the day we left to go to England, or a couple of days before, one of the leaders came and met us in our house and said, you shouldn't go, you know, and then looked us straight in the eyes and said this, if you go, nothing but failure will follow you the rest of your life. I tell you, when we got off that plane at Heathrow, just knew a few people, that's all. It can take some recovery. You've got to get out of the cave. Someone's got to touch you on the cheek and turn it, huh? Because there's not a lot of initiative to get going. We lived up in the middle of England and every Friday night, just to keep our hearts going, we'd get in a car, a few of us would get in a car, we'd drive 100 miles down to London just to walk the streets of Soho every night and round Piccadilly Circus just to pick up the heroin addicts and the drag addicts out of the street to prop them up till the ambulances would come and get them because we just could not sit and do nothing. We found a little congregational church that would let us use their basement. We'd take them back in there and try to help them and, until the ambulances and the police and different things arrived. Just saying that because it was out of that that what we're living in today was born. And out of your story and your testimony and sometimes out of the ashes a phoenix rises but you've got to deal with your own demons you've got to come out of the cave I can remember when I first started to see signs and wonders begin to happen and I'd get asked to go and minister with the people that were helping us, and I'd go and minister and see signs and wonders, and I'd make all the calls, and people would begin to come forward. And God would all, was giving me quite a sharp, in those days, word of knowledge, life and things. And God would give me pictures and dates and rooms, and I mean, it still does at times. But I'd see things, and every time people would begin to come forward, this thing would shout in my head, they were, it won't work, because nothing but failure will follow you the rest of your life. And there, right in the meeting, I'd have to bring every thought into captivity and say, I choose another report. But I tell you, don't get in your emotions first. This kingdom is making some right choices at right times, amen? And so we're going to honor some of those people because one thing that happened in that time was in the place where we were, 
and I, I'm not going to that because we're streaming everything here today, but in the place we were, a little, a little, literally, little in physique, but a huge heart, mi returned missionaries from India, came from the far-reaching tips of Wales, from a little town called Milford Haven that's known as England beyond Wales, really, down in Dublin or Pembrokeshire. And she came down to the base where we were living and asked, the Holy Spirit's moving around. This place never even got touched by the Welsh revival and said, the Holy Spirit's moving around and we're a group of believers, but nothing's happening in our town. We need a team to come and give us help. And the guy leaving the base that had taken us in and was bringing healing into our lives, he said, you guys have got a team in a sense. Why don't you go down and check it out? And we went down. And then we went down again, and Mara and I went down for a two-week outreach, and we ended up staying two years. And that was in 76 and 77, what we're celebrating in England in this um, time at the end of the year. You know, the remarkable thing, we see more miracles in our cluster life in Church of the Nations through that little church still in Milford Haven today than anywhere else around. Even in its rebirth, restart, all that kind of thing. But you know, the amazing thing of it, and the great thing will be that that little return missionary from India has just written a book on that journey and that story, and we're going to release that at the conference, but she'll be there with us as well because she's still a part of the church down there. And when the little revival broke out there, it broke out in a girls' high school, a grammar school for girls. I got asked to go in and teach, and I went in. It was just kids around 13, 14, 15 years old, whatever, and I just spoke on the Father heart of God and the love of God and a few girls began to get saved. So then we opened up a place down the, in the main street and they'd come down after and get baptized in the spirit, etc. And two of those girls are two of the leaders in the church now and they'll be there with us as well. So sometimes it's quite a, that's 30 years ago or more, 35, 40 years ago. It's a long way back. Yeah, 40 years ago, of course, that, that's what we're celebrating it. But I want to tell you, there's a story to tell, and you have a story to tell. But I'm just saying it to you today because sometimes people look and say, you know, and on you were you the founders and fathers of Church of the Nations, etc. We're very blessed for the honor and place you guys give us in our heart. But I want to tell you that anything you live in today was raised up or started out of people who very much knew they were earthen vessels. And from that day knew that that treasure was in cracked vessels. And I tell you, you'll never see the fullness of the kingdom and what God wants to do through your life until somewhat you walk with a limp. Because forever you'll always know. I can tell you the story when it happened, that without God we're nothing. Without the presence of his spirit. We were doing with this man who released us out into our new day, we did a, a, a tent crusade down in Ashford in Kent. It, right back in 19, it would have been 75, I guess, or 76, somewhere around the same time. And then we put up this tent out in the fields. And in those days for England, it was big crowds. We would get about 600 people in that tent a night. We went for three weeks or four weeks every night except Monday nights. And the power of God would begin to move. We saw things, you know, like I'd never seen before, just really amazing things would take place. We saw people come down from the city of London in pinstripe suits and we'd be baptizing in the front in a big tank, in a big tent and as we were baptizing in the, in the they would come running down the aisles in their suits and jump in fully suited and get saved and baptized I remember one night a girl was sitting in the front row leg all bandaged up on crutches and that kind of thing. The power of God just did it. We went down, said, you're healed, take off the bandages. He said, what happened? She said, I walked on broken glass. I've got 30 stitches in my foot or something, and I've just come from the hospital. We said, undo it. You're healed. You're whole. They didn't undo it. We undid them. They unbandaged it like that, lifted up a foot. There wasn't even a scar, not a stitch, just baby skin. I've seen God do it but I want to tell you out of all those things something began to rise in our hearts this is my last point
what is the key or where does it all fit together? Or well, maybe just say this much and really make this the last point. But I want to tell you this. Until the love of God compels you, it's still all just stuff. At the end of the day, it's stuff. If I look at where the fruit is, it's not because the baby skin. Praise God for it and the fruit that can come. But it's the, it's the people that could stand up and just say, like John said last night, God loves me. I've seen more lives changed with a hug than a 20-minute sermon. Because we live in an orphan world. Do you understand? I live in a city where my son-in-law works in schools in the downtown area of the city. It's estimated in Richmond in the city boundaries in the downtown area that it's very close now statistically to around 90% of the children in that city come from un one-parent families or no-parent families. It's an orphan world. And a lot of what we still do and we're about doesn't even relate to where they're at anymore. The gap is getting bigger. And the cry is getting louder. And I want us to somehow believe, I, if I was to share the message on love, I thought I'd just tell a bit of story, life today, but on love, you can't help but get back to 1 Corinthians 13, can you, in the whole, what we call the love chapter. And it basically declares in the end, these three are going to remain. If you want three foundations in your life, you're going to have to learn and understand how they walk and how they operate. But he said, these three shall remain, not one of them, not two of them, but these three, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. I wrote in an AC talk just briefly, I often put it out, but I've learned over life is this, that you see vision through hope, you release it through faith, and you maintain it through love. Because faith brings into the now what hope gives you a real possibility for. Now, biblical hope is not like, I hope I get a new bike for Christmas. Biblical hope is a futuristic absolute. We have a hope in the return of Jesus to come back to his kingdom. We have this tremendous hope. It's a futuristic absolute. And from that absolute in our lives, faith becomes the evidence for the parts of what we need for today. You see, God doesn't expect us to have faith for all of it. But faith brings into being but I, that which we hope for. But I want to tell you today, it is still all clanging symbols, the Bible says. It's still just sounding brass, unless love is at the very heart of it. I often have people ask me, you know, how do you move in word and knowledge? How do you get gifts of the Spirit and that kind of thing? I don't know anybody. There may be many, many, but I don't know anybody, really, that has got a signs and wonders ministry that didn't get us started on the streets. Very few I know got started in meetings. Because I tell you, when you're sitting in the gutter with a prostitute or a drug addict or someone that's coming out of something or into something, and your only hope is if you get a word for them, you'll get a word. One of the first words of knowledge I ever got was trying to deliver a hell's angel in the little shop, outreach shop we was running. This guy was so wild he could go straight up the wall, so possessed. And as he went up the wall, in his leathers and chains and everything else, he would cry out and he'd be praying the Satan's Lord prayer, Our Father who art in hell. And I got a guy I'm supposed to be training with me. I turned around, I said to him, man, I'm scared. He said, if you're scared, I'm out of here. I said, grab my hand, but really I was grabbing his. <laughs> I said, grab my hand. Let's get rid of that demon. You know what it feels like a few minutes later when you see this big hunk of a guy, bare chest, tattooed all over, tears rolling down his face, laying on the thing, crying out, my father, who art in heaven. You see... I remember a guy come in one night in those times to wreck our shop and wreck everything else and God just give us a, I said, God, I need a word. I'm scared. 
He was coming at us, grabbing us around the throat and everything else. And I just felt God say to me, or oh, I just found myself saying, you hated being raised in that boy's home and that woman who looked after you hated her guts. And the guy just looked at me and I was on a roll. So that bit was from God, but now it's time for a bit from me. And I said, and if you don't repent, you're going to hell. He just looked at me and said, how do you know that about me? Fell back in the seat. I said, I don't know. But God loves you enough to tell me. That night was when the gang kids began to get saved because they were looking through the window and I told them for weeks. I told them for weeks that the God we serve is more powerful than what they've given their life to. They all fled out that night, but they didn't go home. They were looking through the window. If we had a lost it that night, we would have lost them maybe for eternity. See, people need to see a manifestation of what it's about, but you're not going to just get it all going, just prophesying over the same people another time. Just praying over the same believers who have never walked in the last word they got anyhow. Waiting for another one. When out there there's people that's just waiting for someone to tell them the truth. And truth that no one knows. So they know it was God. Oh, we could talk about it all day, couldn't we? Now abide, faith, hope and love, these three, but the greatest is love. I just want to say this, and this is my final point. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul and your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. Here's the problem with the love question. Here's the problem with being compelled by love and this is the one you've got to get free of because the problem is with us not reaching the world like we should is we are biblical Christians. We are biblical Christians. We love God. But the problem is we love the neighbor as ourselves, and we hate ourselves. We're insecure in ourselves and we love our neighbours the same way. When the Bible said, love God with all your heart, your soul and mind and love your neighbour as yourself, many Christians do. The trouble is they haven't learned to love themselves. If we only love ourselves in a biblical way of understanding what that means and a godly way of understanding, that we know the Father's love upon our life, we know whose we are in him, and we begin to be able to identify fully with what he's about with us. And insecurities and fears, oh, we'll get tempted with them, but those insecurities and fears that come at us eventually don't bring us under anymore. For a loving dad lifts us above and his love compels us and propels us, someone said last night, to go. So I just want to pray for you today and commission you to go out from this place with a love that can change the world. I want to tell you anything that God's used Marilyn and I for, Louis and Ed's for, Dave and Carol for. Anyone else here? Will your family or Ken? Anyone around here? We had nothing more going for us than you've got going for you. But one day something... Just triggered. Sometimes people ask us, ask Marilyn and I, how come you've seen so much happen? Sometimes we wonder what has happened, but we look and say, this one thing, we always answer the same way, and we look at one another sometimes and say it to one another. It's the only thing we can put it down to is one day we said to God, anywhere, any place, any time, we're available. And I learned something, that God can do something with your availability he can't even do with your spirituality. And I want to tell you, be careful how you pray for answers for your city. Pray, careful how you pray for answers for your nation, because you might be the one that God uses to answer your prayer. And that can be nervous at times. God send people, what about you? We had to learn early in our life that God told us to go into all the world. He never told us to come back. And I had to learn from a man who fathered me through that broken time, who helped me get through it. I had to learn because one day he looked at us and he said this and he taught us. He said, becoming a missionary is not crossing the sea. It's seeing the cross. 
We need to cry out, give us the cross, Lord, that we can live in the resurrection and carry this love to a dying world. So, Father, we pray today, whether people are watching this on a screen, in other nations, around this great country, and right here in this building, we pray, God, that we would not in a few months look back and say, wasn't that a good conference we had? But we might look back and say we were propelled and compelled by love to go into a dying world and to make a difference. You see, it's only our own garden we'd attend, not anyone else's, but there's always a goal in it. Whether you go around the world or around the block, whether you go across the seas or across the street, you're a missionary. And we want to pray a Father's blessing over you today, a Father of love, to send you out, compelled by love. Ask God, when kids come to you and they've got a list like I read out to you today of every kind of sexual situation and gender confusion and all that kind of thing, don't judge them. Love them. Love them. I was praying at the prayer line last night and face to face with some of the very thing in that list. Let's not put our heads in the ground, people. This is real stuff, real time, real life. We live in Church of the Nations now where we've had our leaders and have to walk through very serious things with their children and areas like that. We have to face it face to face now. It's real stuff. It's called life. But this love compels us. Sometimes I hear people say, oh, these, that person who does that, that, they just need to repent. And Well, we understand all that. But it's the goodness of God. It's the love of God that leads to repentance. Not whipping another broken person. Hold them and love them before you correct them. So, Father, in Jesus' name, if you sense God's over these days, not just this morning, but it's just pulling on your heart and you just sense you want to make a fresh commitment or a fresh cry to God. God, let your love compel me and propel me. Let me see people through your eyes. I was very young in ministry when I heard David Wilkerson share a message we were doing similar things, but in a very small way to what they were doing in New York at the time, but out in Australia. He was kind of our hero, the skinny preacher on the streets of New York City. And he preached a message that shifted my heart forever. You understand, I've worked it out. This is probably the 98th or 99th Church of the Nations conference I've been at. Somewhere, this next one in England is around the 100th. It's many messages. But I can remember a handful of them because they shifted me. But I want to say this to you. David Wilkerson shared this message on the baptism of the Holy Spirit that we heard about last night. And the title of the message was this. What kind of power is this? You shall receive power when the Holy Ghost comes upon you. You shall receive power when the Holy Ghost upon you, comes upon you. And he preached about South Africa, actually, and things. But he preached, what kind of power is this? And he went through. Before Pentecost, the disciples had healed the sick, raised the dead, cast out demons, fed 5,000 supernaturally, went through all the... What kind of power did they need that they hadn't touched? What was the power they were waiting for? And he finishes off by just simply saying, after an hour's teaching, but saying this, the power of Pentecost had to be the power to love like Jesus loved because they could do the works but until the cross and Pentecost they couldn't have his heart because the firstborn of many uh, the only begotten son became the firstborn of many and until they could cry out from within Abba Father 
know that love to compel them. 